Hey, hey, hey! This lecture is designed to help you with the respiratory system for uh, Anatomy 202. So let's go ahead and dig in. Um, breathing, that's what this is all about. And so I always start this lecture by asking the question, why must we breathe, right? So why must someone breathe? And you're probably thinking, or in the class setting when I ask it, people normally say, to stay alive. We have to breathe to stay alive. And yes, that's true. So let me ask it a different way. Why is breathing essential for staying alive? What is it about bringing oxygen in and CO2 out that makes us stay alive? And the answer is energy. And so on the next slide, it'll tell you at the bottom, the goal is to make ATP, which is energy. You want to know that ATP is cellular energy. But that's the whole purpose. We we eat food for energy, but we have to have oxygen to break down the food. And so that's the that's the uh, the big goal here is to make energy. And so without you eat food and with oxygen you can break that food down. And that's how you get energy from the food that you eat. And so that's kind of why respiratory and digestive go together, I guess. But respiration is the process of getting oxygen in and CO2 out. Now, getting the CO2 out is pretty important. We've got to get that CO2 as a waste product broken down from the the foods that we eat. CO2 is acidic. And so you got to push it out in order to stay alive. And so oxygen in to get energy, but CO2 out to maintain that pH. So it's the process of exchanging uh, gases between the atmosphere and the body and we'll learn in this lecture that the atmosphere plays a pretty important role um, and then respiration consists of the following events ventilation external respiration so breathing it in and then you got to get transport of gases between the lungs and maybe my bicep cells my my pinky toe muscles internal and then cellular respiration that's actually where after the food is broken down, your cells break down the food even more. So break it down, break the simplest form down, and actually make the energy. Okay, so respiratory tract, this is what it's made of. The nose, the nasal cavity, the sinuses, the pharynx, then the larynx, the trachea, the bronchial trees, which would be in the lungs, and then the lungs. So take a second, pause the video, Check out this picture, but I do want to point some stuff out. Uh, we think about the nose coming in. Let's go with black here. Okay. The nose brings oxygen in, and so does the mouth. Oh, I went too far, didn't I? And so does the mouth. Well, they really go to the same place. And that place we call is the pharynx. And so all of this right here is your pharynx. And there's the nasopharynx behind the nose, the oropharynx behind the mouth, and then the laryngeal pharynx behind the larynx. So that should kind of help you with what the pharynx is. And then the larynx a little bit lower, right here. And then the trachea, and we'll call this the bronchial tree. And that's primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. We'll look at that closer in a little while. And then, of course, you've got two lungs. So, let's move on. Okay, the nasal cavity is here. Um, what, kind of, what makes up the nasal cavity? Goblet cells, remember those are cells that secrete snot or mucus, better, I guess is a better word. Uh, and there is ciliated, pseudostratified... We got ciliated twice. I guess ciliated is important right there. Uh, and the cilia, what they do is they, they brush, they're the little hair like structures right here on the top, and they brush and brush and brush the, um, they catch the particles. So if you breathe in dust or bacteria, hopefully the cilia will catch it. Now, um, if you'll remember from 201, the pseudostratified columnar, columnar are the epithelial cells that are shaped like this. And the pseudostratified had the nuclei at different levels. A pseudo faults. They appear to be layered, but they're not layered. So they look like they're layered, but they're because of the uh, nucleus, but they're not. But you do want to know that the pseudostratified uh, 
cells have cilia, and I edited that and took it out. Okay, sinuses, they're holes. We know, unfortunately, we know too much about what sinuses are, but they're air-filled spaces in the skull, in the bones, maxillary, frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid uh, bones of the skull, and they're, they're openings. The purpose is that um, they help the head not be so heavy. So it says they have mucous membrane lining, um, so they have a little thin snot layer. The mucus reduces the weight. However, uh, ours, if you live in the south, it should be it should be empty, but if you live in the south, yours is filled with snot all the time, so your head's heavier. But No, I'm just kidding, but it seems that way sometimes. Okay, smoking. And I'm not a smoker, and I know some of you are, and I may step on some toes, but um, I, one thing I always think is how interesting it is that the media can control our image of something. And so back a long time ago, smoking was okay. It was actually the cool thing to do because it happens in movies and you, um, you know, it was on commercials and things like that. Well, at some point they, they removed all cigarette commercials. If you'll notice, there are no cigarette commercials on TV. And they put the warning label on there. They took all the billboards down. Uh, and now there's those commercials on TV about how smoking is bad for you. And so now our generation... I'm, I don't know how old you are, but I'm assuming we're close to the same age. Um, our generation, appear we look at smoking as trashy. It's bad for you. People who smoke don't care about themselves. And so it's so funny to see how the media can change our opinion in just a matter of 20 years about something. And so I always think, be cautious of, of what we believe and see on the media because it, it really does have an impact on our society. But anyway, okay, smoking. My grandmother was a smoker, and she smoked a pack a day from the time she was 16 until the time she died when she was 90. So she lived a long, healthy life smoking. But it's respiratory system damage is slow, progressive, and sometimes deadly. Uh, so, you, so you definitely want to know the effects of smoking. Smoking slows and eventually paralyzes those cilia. Now, why do we have to have the cilia? Why are they so important? Well, the cilia catch the, the dust or the bacteria that we breathe in, and so they're very important. We need that cilia there. Um, it says, and dirt pathogens can no longer be removed. There's a smoker's cough. My grandmother, when I would spend the night with her, when she would wake up first thing in the morning, she would sit on the bed she would put her feet off on the floor and she would cough and cough and cough and cough and cough first thing in the morning, every morning, and she would cough up this black mucus, like a tar almost, from the cigarettes. So it occurs when the cilia are no longer functioning and it's from, so, so no, I said no, the effects, one is paralyzed cilia, two would be excess mucus from the damage. Um, so now the pathogens can access the respiratory system, so Theoretically, people who smoke get sick more often. Coughing leads to bronchitis, um, bronchial thickness. So the, the bronchial tree that we looked at, it should expand and um, get smaller with every breath. And theirs is thick, and so it doesn't move like it should. Uh, alveolar walls are destroyed, so the alveoli are destroyed, and that we call that emphysema. So the, we're going to look about, we're going to look at, alveolar later in the video, but they're little sac-like structures in the lungs, and they hold the oxygen, and that's something that's not replaceable, and so a lot of the the lining to the lungs is replaceable, so if, if you smoke, anybody, not just people in the class, but if someone smokes and they stop right now, the lungs will um, heal themselves, but the alveolar will not grow back, uh, so abnormal cells may divide, causing cancer, 20% of uh, people who smoke get lung cancer. I will tell you this, however, 80% um, of the people that have lung cancer are smokers. So only 20% of the people who smoke get cancer, but of the people, like almost everybody that's diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer, is a smoker. Of course, there's the, uh, you know, some people are not. And then the environmental tobacco smoke also endangers non-smokers. So that would be you know, what we call secondhand smoke.
Okay, fair next. We looked at that at the at that very first picture, and you want to know the order here. So you've got the the like nostrils, of course, will be first, and then nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and that leads to the trachea, which is not part of the larynx, but so know that order. You got nostrils first. Nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngeal pharynx. Take a second and look at that picture. Um, most of that will be on the lab exam, so you definitely want to know it. But where's the pharynx? It's behind the nose and mouth, passageway for food and air, aids in sound production. Okay, the larynx, that's, you know, down a little bit lower, an enlargement in the airway superior to the trachea. So below the pharynx, but it says uh, superior to the trachea. Moves air in and out. Houses the vocal cords. Now there's three types of cartilage here. So let's highlight this. We got thyroid cartilage. That's the largest. And that's what we call the Adam's apple. So highlight that. The Adam's apple is the thyroid cartilage. So you'll see that on the picture over here. Um, cricoid cartilage. Those are below. And you'll see them. They're like ring shapes. Um, and they they hold the they actually hold the larynx and the trachea open, and then the epiglottic that's is part of the flap, and we'll talk about the epiglottis if we haven't already, but the epiglottis write this in. It's a flap that closes the trachea. when you, we, whatever, swallow food. So it's a little door-like structure that every time you swallow, it closes, swallow food or saliva, it closes so that the, the food goes into the esophagus, not the trachea. Okay, different kinds of vocal cords. You have false vocal cords and true vocal cords. Uh, with the false, there's no sound. But with true vocal cords, that's where you're going to get your sounds from. And the vocal cords are in the larynx. The trachea, that's the windpipe. So look at the picture. You can see it leading down into the lungs. It extends downward anterior to the esophagus. So it's in, it's in front of the esophagus. When you touch your throat, you're touching your trachea. As it enters the thoracic cavity, it splits into right and left bronchi. So right here, right and left bronchi lined with ciliated mucous membrane, so it's got cilia in it. Uh, so cilia is the little hair-like structures and snotty substance. It's got these 20, see those little cartilage rings? It's got those cartilage rings, and those cartilage rings, they hold it open, and so so your trachea never closes. Your esophagus, it does close. Remember the peristalsis movement, if you've watched the digestive lecture already? the peristalsis movement in the esophagus opens and closes but the trachea doesn't it doesn't close a tracheostomy that would be they do this on TV all the time I know how to do it no, I'm just kidding uh, most of what I know about clinical experience I got from Grey's Anatomy okay a tracheostomy is a procedure that cuts an opening in the trachea to insert a tube for air exchange, so if like someone's coughing or you know there's a blockage, this is done for an object that is lodged in the larynx, lodged in the larynx. So you'll see they they tilt the head back and they cut it, and then they use on TV they use like an ink pen or something. Don't do that. They have little pipes that you're supposed to use. <clears throat> okay, the bronchial tree, and they say it's a tree because if you were to turn it upside down, it would look like a tree. Consists of branched airways leading from the trachea to the microscopic sacs in the lungs. So to these little alveoli, I think I mentioned those when we were talking about cigarette smoke. They, the destruction of alveoli is emphysema. So that's your bronchial tree. Okay, you can see how I, I pointed this out already, and I'm going to point it out on the last slide instead, actually. Look at this picture. You can see there's your trachea. Okay, and then as they go down, 
that would be primary bronchi, right and left. And then as it splits, then we would call it secondary bronchi. So that's secondary. And then as it splits again, we would call it tertiary bronchi. So primary is just that little short part right there. Let's see. Okay, so this is the trachea in yellow. And then this is the primary bronchi. And then this is the secondary bronchi. And then this is, as it separates out even more, that would be tertiary bronchi. Okay, so but it looks like a tree, and that's why they call it a bronchial tree. And so you can kind of see that on there. Then, then there's the interlobar bronchioles, so in between, all the way down to the alveoli, those little, and they look like grapes, little bundles of grapes that absorb oxygen. And so when you breathe in, the oxygen goes into those alveoli, so they're little air sacs. And then the capillary, look at the picture, how the capillary wraps around it. You know already that the capillary is where gas exchange occurs. And so in the capillaries, the red blood cell is going to pick up the oxygen. Remember the hemoglobin in the red blood cell? It can pick, hemoglobin can pick up four components of oxygen and take it all the way to the muscles. The alveoli are made up of simple squamous epithelium. So highlight that. Whoops, go back. Here we go. Simple squamous epithelium. That's what they're made of. And so basically, if you'll remember from 201, they're, they're single, simple, flat squamous epithelia. So they're real thin. The alveoli are really, really thin. And so oxygen can diffuse in and out easily. So one layer of flat cells... Uh, so they can diffuse in and out real easy. Okay, so this is showing you the alveoli and the oxygen moving. So oxygen is diffusing in. So alveoli provide surface area for gas exchange. Where does gas exchange occur? In the alveoli. That's where. During gas exchange, the oxygen diffuses. Diffusion is the movement of particles from high concentration to low concentration. So if you have a lot of oxygen, let's say high concentration here, it's going to diffuse out to the arteries and veins, out into the capillaries. So it's all about it's all about the movement of particles from high to low. And movement of particles because of the pressure. CO2 diffuses from the blood, let's see where is it right there, into. So Oxygen's going to the blood, CO2 is going back into the alveoli, so that when you exhale, CO2 comes out. Lungs. Okay, if you ever come to Gaston State and feel the cadaver lungs, which I would love for us to, we'll set up a date to do that. But the lungs, if you're interested, the lungs are, they feel just like a sponge. When you feel them on the cadavers, the dead bodies, they, the lungs are squishy like a sponge like if like the stomach is kinda like a water balloon and the liver is like hard like grass like you know like the ground is hard it's really hard but the lungs are squishy and it feels like when you squeeze them you can just almost feel the little air pockets spongy uh, cone-shaped organs in the thoracic cavity now highlight that there the right lung the right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes. Now, remember that this is the left and this is the right. So, for all anatomy purposes, so the right lung is going to be over here and the left lung is going to be over here. So, why does the right lung have three lobes and the left lung only has two lobes? Well, hopefully you guessed, and it's because of the heart. So the heart is over here, and it takes up some space. So the right lung needs to be a little bit smaller than the left lung, or left side. Okay, the lungs. The helum is just that opening where the blood vessels can enter. Okay, visceral pleura. So highlight that. 
that's it's a serous membrane attached so it is attached right to the lung so look at the picture let's see if we can see it uh, right there it is attached right to the lungs uh, it uh, tightly attaches right around it surrounds the lungs the parietal pleura is what lines the thoracic cavity so it's going to be a little bit it's not touching but the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, they have this oily substance in between them so they can slide. As your lungs inhale and exhale, just like the heart, there's it's an oiled substance, a serous fluid, so that the as the lungs expand, the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura rub together and it doesn't hurt. Uh, if you ever have an infection in those pleural membranes, it hurts. It's like friction every time the lungs inhale and exhale. Okay, this is a just a table, a nice nice summary of the respiratory system parts, what they like, where they are, and what they do. So this table is a nice summary of what we've talked about thus far. Okay, breathing. Breathing consists of an inspiration. I do that every time. There we go. An inspiration and an expiration. So inspiration, you inhale. Expiration, you exhale. So two movements, inhale, exhale. Now as you breathe in, the lungs expand. As you breathe out, the lungs collapse. So they get smaller. Okay, uh, at, uh, it's all about pressure. It's all about, it's not all about the base. Just kidding. Ho hopefully you got that. Uh, it's all about the pressure. So atmospheric pressure is the force that moves air into the lungs. So, and that's why it changes with different altitudes. We'll talk about that at the end of the lecture. But as you breathe in, it's all about the pressure. So atmospheric pressure is the force that moves air into the lungs. When respiratory muscles are at rest, the atmospheric pressure and the alveolar pressure are equal. So in between that inhale and exhale, for just a second, when there's a break, it's at rest. So when respiratory muscles are at rest, when one cycle of breathing is finished, the atmospheric pressure and the alveolar pressure are equal. Okay, so you do want to know, well, I'll tell you later. Okay, pressure and volume, here we go, that's what I want you to know. Highlight pressure and volume of gas are inversely related and that's Boyle's law. Right in as pressure increases volume decreases or vice versa. So if you look at the syringes over here you know volume is how you measure on a syringe so as the volume increases that'd be this one as the volume increases pressure decreases so they are inversely related Pressure and volume are inversely related. Okay, so you highlight it inversely, but you want to know one increases, the other decreases. If the pressure in the lungs and the alveoli decrease, atmospheric pressure is gonna, the atmosphere is going to push air down in in response to the pressure difference. So it's so neat that the atmospheric pressure kind of controls that. Okay, muscles involved. You want to know two muscles that are involved. The sternocleidomastoid muscle and the pectoralis minor, sternocleidomastoid and pectoralis minor. Now I do want to mention this surfactant. It's a polypeptide that is a protein, polypeptide protein that helps with breathing. So surfactant reduces surface tension in the alveoli to help lung expansion. Okay, so here's a picture you can see normal inspiration and then maximal inspiration when you really breathe. Take a deep, deep breath in and you can see here the muscles involved, sternocleidomastoid, and remember it connects from the mastoid process across the sternum to the clavicle, across the clavicle to the sternum, and then pectoralis minor there, just just on top of the chest, the little bitty like flap-like ones on top of the chest, underneath pectoralis major. So those are the two muscles involved, but you'll see um, as as the lungs expand, just like the syringe, as volume increases, the pressure decreases. So pressure change causes the movement of air. And remember, um, 
pressure on the inside of the lungs is equal to the outside if they're at rest. And atmospheric pressure is going to push in when it's not. Okay. The forces responsible for normal resting come from the elastic recoil, and that's of lung tissue and abdominal organs as tissue return to their normal shape at the end of one cycle, at the end of one inspiration. And then surface tension in the alveoli. So that's the forces responsible. Now I do want to, I do want you to highlight this right here. The residual volume, that's the amount left, the pressure left after in the lungs after the forced expansion. So highlight that. That's the what's left over after you breathe out. Okay, and you can see this picture, that's just expiration. So the the breathing out still increased verse and in inverse um, decrease in pressure. Okay, and the, I will not ask you these numbers, so don't don't try to memorize these numbers, but that will just give you kind of some vocabulary. So tidal volume is the volume of air moved in and out of our lungs during respiratory cycle. So that's how much we actually move. Let's see, we highlighted this. The residual volume is the volume of air that remains in the lungs after a maximal respiratory effort. So, And you can just kind of see, kind of like vocabulary. Um, inspiratory capacity, that's the maximum volume of air that can be inhaled. So how much can you inhale? Functional residual capacity, the volume of air that remains in the lungs following the breathe out. Okay, this is what makes the respiratory system fun, I guess. No, it's all fun, but coughing, sneezing, laughing, crying, hiccuping, yawning, and speaking, these are, these are the non-respiratory movements. So it doesn't have anything to do with breathing, but it's the non-respiratory movements. Oh, it's right there. Let's just circle that instead of writing it. But that's what makes life fun. Okay, so these are some disorders that deal with the respiratory system. And the first one I want you to highlight, RDS, or Respiratory Distress Syndrome. It happens uh, in infants. And it's, normally this surfactant is that polypeptide of that protein that's developed at 32 weeks and so it's very important that the baby makes it to 32 weeks. Now um, without it they can put the baby on a, a respirator and give them little puffs of air instead of big inhalations and exhalations until that it, until it develops so don't worry too much but you definitely want to get to 32 weeks because of respiratory distress syndrome. Okay bronchial asthma that's going to be an allergic reaction and then emphysema, we've already kind of mentioned, that's where those alveoli are destroyed. Um, my grandmother, the one I told you about that smoked, she had emphysema. Uh, there, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, that's chronic bronchitis. And there's commercials about COPD medications. Okay, what controls breathing? And there's two there's two parts in the brain. It's the medulla oblongata, which we'll see here. They call it the respiratory air areas. But from 201, I'm sure you remember. Oops, that's not it. Medulla oblongata and the pons. Oh, highlighted them both. There you go. Uh, the medullary respiratory center. Medulla oblongata or pons. So I like those two. Okay, partial pressure. In a mixture of gases, each gas contributes a portion to the total pressure. So partial pressure is the amount of gas, let's highlight that, amount of gas, amount of pressure each gas contributes to the total pressure. So highlight all of that. So gas ex it's the gas exchange between the alveolar and the capillary. So a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of CO2. Um, so it says, what is the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere? So it'd be, the air is approximately 21% oxygen. A lot of it is nitrogen. Some of it is CO2. Atmospheric pressure is 760, and that's milligrams of HG is mercury. But write this in, it's the gas exchange between...
alveolar air and capillary blood pressure. Okay, what affects your breathing? First, the partial pressure, so the particles of oxygen. If you're up high or down low, or you know, if, if a room you're in doesn't have enough oxygen, the partial pressure of CO2, getting it out there, so if you have a lot of CO2 in the blood, you're gonna push that out because of the acidity, the degree of stretch in lung tissue, so we said that smoking decreases that. Uh, emotional state, perhaps uh, a stressful situation makes you breathe harder, and then level of physical activity. And so if you um, exercise often or don't, and there's a slide at the end of the video about that. Okay, receptors involved include mechanoreceptors, and that'd be like a chemical or a physical receptor, and central and peripheral chemoreceptors, so it said chemoreceptors. Main controlling factor are usually the CO2, the acidity, you gotta get that acid out. So if you're working out, um, lifting weights, creating lots of CO2, you're gonna breathe harder because you gotta get it out. And you gotta get oxygen in and hydrogen concentration. Okay, so what does exercise do? And if you know me personally, some of you do, I, am, I enjoy exercising. Uh, exercise can generally can greatly exercise can greatly increase the amount of oxygen used each minute, and so as we exercise, uh, you need energy, right? So as you exercise, you need energy, and I said at the beginning of the video, you got to have oxygen to make that energy. So the amount of um, oxygen you need is directly related to how much energy you are using. So during exercise, increased breathing rate would be expected to result from the decrease in blood oxygen. So you're using that oxygen to make energy. So you need more oxygen. And you're also, you've got increased CO2 because you're lifting weights or running, whatever. You're gonna push it out. However, although breathing rate does increase, blood levels of oxygen and CO2 do not change significantly. So you're breathing. Um, the cerebral cortex is what controls that, controls the breathing rates. But that's basically why when you exercise, you need more oxygen, and you got to get the CO2 out. Okay, the alveoli, we already said they're little grape-like structures, and they're microscopic. You can't see them, because one of the first times I came up here to look at the cadaver, I was like, where are the alveoli? This is before I taught anatomy. Um, and that you have to see them with a microscope. There's little pores in them that permit air to pass from one alveoli to another, so little poor ways for oxygen and then there's macrophages in there oh there we go alveolar macrophages that's going to be those immune system cells that phagocytize bacteria so if the cilia didn't catch it hopefully the macrophage will and you'll never get sick so macrophages in the alveoli to get rid of any foreign bodies that were not caught by the cilia. Okay, the respiratory membrane. Most of the wall of the alveoli consists of, we already highlighted this, I feel like, three times. Simple squamous epithelium, little flat, thin layer. Okay, part of the wall secrete that surfactant, that protein that, if it's not developed correctly, causes respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, gas exchange between the alveoli air, alveolar air, and the blood occurs through the respiratory membrane, which consists of these three structures. So it says the alveolar wall, the capillary wall, so it's got to be, both of those are real thin, and then the basement membrane, thin layers that lie between those two. Okay, so what causes it to move? It's the movement of molecules from high to low. It's diffusion. The movement of molecules from high to low. And so the highlight all this. The driving force of diffusion is pressure. The what causes all breathing to happen, movement, is the pressure. Okay, just look at the picture. You've got, you do not have to know these numbers. 
you've got 45 and 40. So if molecules move from high to low, the oxygen is going to be leaving the blood and going into the alveoli. Okay, look at the, now I'm going to erase that, look at the CO2 particles. CO2 is, oh that was CO2. Okay, let me start over, sorry. 45 CO2 goes to 40 and it's leaving the blood going into the alveoli. I think I said that part right. Now CO2, so you got to get CO2, remember the muscles in your bicep made the CO2. We got to get CO2 back to the lungs so we can breathe it out. So this would be out, right out of the lungs. Now look at the oxygen. You've got 104, so high pressure of oxygen and only 40. Oxygen's moving in. So it's going to go to the bloodstream so you can carry it back to the bicep. So the movement of molecules is because of the pressure. And that, that MMHG, that's um, mercury. And it all happens because of pressure differences. And just remember that diffusion is high to low. No energy is required. Okay, what happens when you climb a mountain? And I saw a movie recently about this, climbing this mountain. But I can't remember what it was called now. In the whole movie, people were trying to get to the top of the mountain. And people died and all that. But that wasn't a very good story. Sorry. So at high altitudes, as you climb, there's still 20% oxygen, but the pressure of the oxygen decreases. So breathing becomes more difficult. Because remember, it's that atmospheric pressure that pushes the oxygen in. Oxygen diffuses more slowly into the blood, so people get sick. Body attempts to obtain more oxygen by increasing heart and breathing, but doesn't, it doesn't work because the pressure isn't high enough. So high altitude pulmonary edema. Severe from um, altitude sickness, severe form of altitude sickness. Um, the symptoms would include headache, nausea, vomiting, rapid heart, breathing. Cyanosis is a blue color. And so uh, difficulty breathing as you climb high. So hypoxia vasoconstricts the, so the blood vessels get smaller. So can't breathe as good when you're up high. Okay, and this is just a, a, a few uh, disorders that deal with the respiratory system. So read over those. I will mention tuberculosis because that comes from a bacterial infection. So bacterial lung infection. Um, and what's scary about tuberculosis is that it can be airborne, but um, there's drugs that you can take to cure, be cured from tuberculosis. The problem is um, the drugs you have to take for so long, a minimum of six months, I think that's what it is. Okay, so carbon dioxide transport, three ways, you want to know, three ways that carbon dioxide is transported. First, in, highlight, as CO2 dissolved in plasma, it can be bound to the hemoglobin or as a form of bicarbonate. And remember I told you that CO2 is acidic. And so we got to get that CO2 out. And remember we talked about bicarbonates, they regulate blood pH. So we've talked about that in several different videos. Bicarbonate, uh, that's the majority is transported that way. Bicarbonate ions as a result. And so check out this formula below. You'll see that CO2 plus water, that arrow backwards can be, that's carbonic acid. So it could go either way. CO2 and water make carbonic acid or carbonic acid makes, breaks down into CO2 and water. And then you'll see this is the bicarbonate. But look at this formula. It may help you with your T's test when you take that getting ready for nursing school if that's what you're interested in. But you may not have to take that because of the ACT. So that should help. So three ways. You want to know all three ways. It's on this next slide too. We'll highlight it again. Three methods of CO2 transport in the blood. Bicarbonate ion. Plasma. Or bound to the hemoglobin. So that it can... It can bind to the hemoglobin just like the oxygen can. Okay, the chloride shift, which you also want to highlight, it goes in and out as the bicarbonate. And so the shift of chloride ions from the plasma into the red blood cells occurs as a bicarbonate ion. So a negatively charged bicarbonate ion diffuses out of the red blood cell. Chloride ions from plasma diffuse in. So 
the chloride movement, look at the picture. The chloride movement is that bicarbonate ion. And then when the red blood cell gets back to the lungs, CO2 goes into the alveoli or into the lungs, and that's what causes the exhale. Okay, last slide. And as we get older, what happens? Um, the cilia become fewer, so they break down, which would increase infection, right? They're less active. The mucus thickens. Swallowing, gagging, and coughing reflexes are a little bit slower. Macrophages in the lungs lose efficiency, so you may get sick more often. Like, got lots to look forward to, don't you? Uh, increased susceptibility to respiratory infections. Breathing requires more effort, like that emphysema or COPD. Connective tissue replaces muscle and bronchioles, so they don't open and close like they're supposed to. They don't stretch, not open and close, but uh, dilate and constrict like they're supposed to. And then the bronchial walls thin and don't open as much. And then you may even lose some alveoli, but alveolar walls are thinner. They merge and they decrease gas exchange. All right, I hope this video was helpful so you can watch it as many times as you would like and really prepare for this exam.